Poverty is a curse. It is a disease. It is always the result of spiritual warfare. And on this video, I'm going to show you God's ultimate cure for being poor. It's going to blow your mind. It's his perfect cure for being poor. And just because we have so many people, Marin, that's in the Old Testament. Okay, let me help you understand something. The Old Testament is still true, <laughs> okay? And um, the, the reason the New Testament is the New Testament is because of the Old Testament, right? Okay, so there, I'm gonna, let's establish that. First Thessalonians chapter four, starting with verse number 10, and I'm gonna read down, I mean, verse number nine, and I'm gonna read down to um, verse number 12. Here's what it says. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it towards all brethren, which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. That you increase more and more. Okay, let's, let's keep reading. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Why, does he, why is he challenging them to study to be quiet and to do their own business, to work with their own hands as he commanded them? that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. That's paying your bills on time. Not lying about the check being in the mail. Not, not paying with an excuse, but actually paying with money. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have lack of nothing. That's God's plan. That's his perfect cure for you being poor. That you study to be quiet, do your own business, working with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. This whole idea that to be a follower of Christ, you're supposed to be broke as a joke and ready to choke, and drive a rattle trap car and wear hand-me-down clothes, and just, that, it's, it's a satanic lie. And the reason it's a satanic lie is because Satan knows he can't block your blessing from you but he can mental block you from your blessing. He can make you not want it because you think there's something inherently wrong with it. But I got news for you. This whole idea that there's something inherently wrong with making money is satanic. Myron, you sound like a prosperity gospel preacher. I don't know what that means because I haven't found that term in the Bible. But I believe in prosperity, I found that term. And gospel means good news, and I believe in the gospel but I am not telling you, give me money and your life is gonna be blessed. I don't have any blessings for sale. I am telling you that it is not God's design for his people to be broke, period. I'm not gonna back in the door with that, but man, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. I know it does, but see, I've studied it and knows that, knows, I know what that means, and I don't have time to teach that to you today, because on this one, I'm just gonna teach you God's ultimate cure for being poor. It's a perfect cure. It's not a, it's not a kind of, sort of good cure. Here's, here's what's fascinating. God's not gonna be right about heaven and wrong about everything else. And this whole idea that followers of Christ are supposed to be broke is a satanic lie that's been propagated by religion, but it is not in the Bible, period. And I know I'm being a little vehement, but I, just want, I don't want you to miss out on what I'm saying. Right? But Myron, the Bible says, the Bible says uh, you can't serve God in money. Well, it doesn't say that. It says you can't serve God in mammon. And mammon is not money. Mammon is the false god of prosperity. Just in case you were cared to know what mammon was. And whatever you can't serve God in mammon means, and whatever, um, whatever it means when the scripture says labor not to be rich, and whatever it means when it says um, the, the love of money is the root of all evil, Whatever it means, it doesn't contradict what it means when it says the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. So whatever it means, those two verse, those verses have to support each other. It cannot be contradicting the fact that the Bible says that um, the Bible says that the hand of the diligent maketh rich, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So whatever the love of money is the root of all evil means, it's not contradicting that, it's supporting that. And so a misinterpretation will cause you to miss your blessing. So here's what the scripture says. By the way, the reason I read this from the New Testament is so you can understand, yes, it was God's plan in the Old Testament for his people to be prosperous, and it's his plan for, in the New Testament for his people to be prosperous. 
And I don't apologize for that, and I'm not going to, and you can think that I am a prosperity gospel preacher, a false prophet, and the Antichrist, all you want to, but the reality is I'm just going with what the Bible says. Now, here's what's fascinating. When you study the Bible, you have to apply proper biblical interpretation or you are going to come to an erroneous conclusion and believe God said something that he never said. What does proper, proper biblical interpretation look like? It looks like the law of context. The law of context. When I'm reading the text, con means with. Whatever conclusion I come to that this means, it has to be in line with what all the rest of the text says. That includes the verses that come before it, the verses that come after it, and all the other verses in Scripture. Otherwise, I've misinterpreted it. Are y'all tracking? And so, so God's plan for us to not be poor, his ultimate cure for being poor, or his perfect cure for being poor, is to have your own business. It says that you study to be quiet. The word study means be diligent to be quiet. Why is he telling us to be quiet? Because in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lip lends only to penury. What does that mean? Don't talk about what you're going to do. Walk about what you're going to do. Nobody wants to hear. Don't, don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you did. Right? So, so he's saying, stop talking and just go do the work. I did a video recently called um, An Ounce of Proof is Worth a Thousand Pounds of Promise. 10,000 Pounds of Promise. Right? Everybody, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Show me, then talk about it. So he said, study, that means be diligent, to be quiet. Don't talk, work, and do your own business. That literally means to do your own business. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes, it says that a dream cometh through a multitude of business. It tells us in the book of Proverbs, it says, seest thou, this is Proverbs chapter 29, verse two, I think it is, seest thou, verse one, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Business is God's design for his people to create wealth. Entrepreneurship. One of the reasons why Jewish people are so rich is because they believe that. But a lot of Christians got their ideology from Catholicism, about money, from Catholicism, which is a descendant of Roman mythology and Greek mythology. And so they bought into all these lies that the Bible never taught. Interestingly enough, just, so, so just in case y'all wondering, like what is he talking about? Well, what is the physical substance that represents wealth and has since the beginning of time? What is it? Gold. So I was walking through my house one day and I thought to myself, I wonder how many times gold is mentioned in the first book in the Bible? Because another principle is not just the law of context, but also the law of first mention. One of the things about God you have to understand is that he does not change. In order for him to change, you'd have to learn something that he didn't know. And he can't learn something that he didn't know, so he has no reason to change. Are y'all tracking? Yes. Now, we have to change, because there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And when I find out something new that I didn't know, now I gotta do something different than I've been doing so I can get something different than I've been getting. But God don't have to do that. And so, the law of first mention states, whatever God's original design for a thing was, that, or whatever, however God first used something in the Bible, that's his original design for that thing. So I was walking through my house one day, I was thinking, I wonder how many times gold is mentioned in the book of Genesis. And I thought, man, it's got to be in there 500 times. And I looked it up, it wasn't in there 500 times. It wasn't in there 100 times. It wasn't in there 50 times. It was in there exactly eight times. Gold is in the book of Genesis eight times. So what does that tell us? Well, it, what it tells us is that I should go and look and see how gold is being used in context in those eight times God mentions it first in Genesis. When I did that, I was blown away. I was like, wait, what? Because the first time it's mentioned, it's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, and it was talking about the Garden of Eden. Y'all remember the Garden of Eden, right? How many people were in the Garden of Eden again? I forget. What was the population of the Garden of Eden? Two. two. What was the relationship of those two people? Husband and wife. Okay. There are two people. They're husband and wife. And wait a minute. There's more. God told them of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. They could have everything they needed to sustain life for free. Every freely. They got everything for free. Okay, cool. So there's two people. 
Everything's free. There's nothing for sale. There's nothing to buy. Hmm. Why is he putting gold there in the Garden of Eden? Here's what it says. There's gold in that land. The gold of that land is good. Why is there gold in the Garden of Eden if there's nothing to buy? They don't have anything to spend it on. Everything's free. Why? Because God wanted us to know, I believe, that opulence and abundance are natural in the environment for the children of the king. I'm not confused by that. Because the first time gold is mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned as providence for God's people. Providence means to provide in advance. God put the gold there in the garden before he put the man there where the gold was. God put the work there in the garden, the garden itself, to dress it and keep it before he put the man there to do the work. That's the first time it's mentioned. The second time gold is mentioned, it's in Genesis chapter 13. In conjunction with a man named Abram. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 2. After God told Abram, if you leave your country and you leave your kindred, you leave your father's house, I'm going to bless you in ways you can't bless yourself, make you something you can't make yourself, give you something you can't get yourself. I'm going to take the source of your shame, make it the source of your fame, and then you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When God said that, Abram said, I'm out of here. And he left. It says, right after it says that, it says, so Abram departed. Let me ask you a question. Is your obedience to the revelation from God through his word that immediate? It's a good question, isn't it? Okay, back up, fast forward, rewind, here we go. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 13. That was in Genesis chapter 12, God made him that promise. He, le- he leaves, Genesis chapter 13, here's what it says. Genesis chapter 13, verse number two. It says, and Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. So the trick question I have for you this morning is, was Abram rich? No, he was very rich. So I've got a question for you. God calls Abram, promises to bless him, said, if you do what I tell you, I'm going to bless you. He does what he tells him. He gives him gold. If wealth is such a curse, why is God giving it to Abram? It's a good question. Abram is the patriarch of the faith. He's the father of the faithful. He's the friend of God. And when he left, here's what it says. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. It didn't just tell us that Abram was rich. It told us how rich he was, very rich. And it told us how he was rich because God knew that some people were going to say, Myron, it's not talking about, it's not talking about money inheritance. It's talking about, it's talking about a godly heritage. That sounds good if you want to make an excuse for yourself. But God said, I'm going to give him uh, make him very rich in cattle and silver and gold, so you, just so y'all don't be confused. The, right after it says, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, the next verse says, house and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. What does that mean? Well, it means God's design is for fathers to give their children house and riches. How much better would your life be if when you became an adult and got married, your parents gave you a house and some riches, you'd be living a different kind of life right now, wouldn't you? Right. So I'm going to quote a friend of mine, Dr. Sonia. Dr. Sonia here's what she says. You may not come from a wealthy family, but a wealthy family should come from you. And by the way, anybody can do that. Okay. So Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. That's the second time it's mentioned. It's mentioned so the first time it's mentioned, it's mentioned as... Um, providence for God's people. The second time it's mentioned, it's mentioned as a possession by God's people. Hmm. Maybe God intends for his people to have some abundance. In fact, Abram was so rich that when five nations came and conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and took his nephew hostage, he said, oh no, you didn't take my nephew, you didn't take my brother's son. And Abram armed the servants that were born in his house and waged war against five kings and won. Talk about a war chest. One. And then the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah tried to pay Abraham. He said, I I ain't taking no money from you. Why? I don't want you to be able to say you made Abraham rich. He was so rich. Like somebody, they wanted to pay him. Your money ain't no good here. I didn't come save y'all for you. I came to save y'all because my nephew was down there acting a fool. I came to save him. Y'all just got the benefit. The third time gold is mentioned, it's mentioned in Genesis chapter 25, chapter 24, when Eleazar goes to get a wife for Isaac. What? And here's what it says. He told, he said, Lord, (laughs) I love the Bible. It is so, it's so much fun to read if you read it 
and you can see it happening in your mind. It's like, it's like the greatest ever reading. It says, Eleazar is like, Abraham said, you know, I don't, want my, I don't want my son to take a wife from these people around here. I want you to go back to my homeland, find a wife for my son. He, so Eleazar packs up the camels, packs up the stuff, heads out. He stops by a well, he's thirsty. His camels are thirsty. Why? Because it's in the desert. He prays, dear Lord, bless my, father, my, my master Abraham. And when, um, when, when, when somebody comes by, when, when a woman comes to draw a well out of, water out of this well, and I ask her, could I have a, some water? And she says, let me get you some water and some water for your camels. Let that be the one. That's a fairly specific prayer. <laughs> so uh, here comes Rebecca. Um, Ma'am, do you mind if I have a drink of water? She, she said, well, let me get you some water. Let me get some water for your camels too. I, want, I, I wonder if, the reason he prayed that prayer is because he wanted to find a wife who was worth his master's son. And that's a way for her to prove it. Somebody who's willing to go the extra mile. Isn't that what it's about being a spouse, being a husband, being a wife? Like going the extra mile for the person you're married to. Like I've got, I got your six. I'm your covenant partner. Anyway, I'm sidetracking. So she says that. He says, who are your people? Well, I'll take you back and introduce you to my father. And, and so she, he gives her like gold bracelets and all this stuff. And she goes back and says, uh, mom, you won't believe this, this guy. And, and so he reiterates the story about how he prayed and God sent his daughter. Said, and I'm, I came to find a wife for my master's son. And, and so uh, I believe your daughter's the one. And God gave me favor and we're going to leave tomorrow. And her mom said, baby, don't you want to stay a week and just hang out for a little bit? I could, like when I'm reading this, this is what I'm saying. Mama, did you not hear what that man said? His master is rich. His son's going to get everything his master has. He's looking for a wife for that son. And you want me to wait a week so he can go find somewhere, somebody else? Mama, I got to go. I got to get up out of here. I'll see y'all next time we come back to visit. But, and then he gave, he, Eleazar gave gold gifts to her mother and her brothers. Why? Because it was used as proof of God's blessing on God's people. Are y'all tracking? Somebody asked me one time, somebody who goes to my brother's church in Pennsylvania, a good friend of mine, and she said, Myron, why do you talk about business and money all the time? I said, oh, that's easy. I don't want to misrepresent Christ in the marketplace. I don't want to be out there talking about a God of abundance while I'm broke as a joke and ready to choke. I want to be such a good illustration of the blessing of God that people who don't even believe in God want what I got. And I got folk who don't believe in God who come and pay me a lot of money to teach them the stuff I know. And guess where I teach it to them from? The Bible. And they don't, not a, in a dozen years, nobody's ever complained. Oh, why, why do you have to teach me? This is my spot. <laughs> you don't like how we teach it up in there? You can go get you a spot. This is my spot. Got proof of God's blessing on God's people. One of the last times, not the last time, but one of the last times it's mentioned is Genesis 41, 42. And this is when it's shown as a provision for God's people. This is the only time we will see in the book of Genesis somebody who's not a child of God has gold. And this is when Pharaoh took the chain off his neck and the gold ring off his finger and put it on Joseph's neck and Joseph's finger. Which reminds me of the fact the reason God gives wealth to people who are not his children, and I know some people believe everybody's a child of God. I don't believe that because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says those who, by, we are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. And there are people who disagree with that. And you're welcome to your opinion. So when you do your video, you make sure you say that. Okay, so, <laughs> but up in here, <laughs> and here's what's fascinating about that. The Bible teaches the reason people who are not the children of God have the ability to accumulate wealth is so they can hand it over. It, it's in the Bible in more than one place. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. I didn't put that in there. This is my favorite, though. Ecclesiastes 2.26 for God give it to the man that is good in his sight. The man is what? Good in his sight. Wisdom, 
knowledge, and joy. What's God give the man that's good in his sight? Wisdom, knowledge, and joy. And then he says, but to the sinner. Now, notice he didn't say and to the sinner. Because if he said and to the sinner, he named something different. He said, but to the sinner, which means he's about to give them something different. <laughs> but to the sinner, he giveth travail. What's that, hard labor? He giveth travail to gather and to heap up. Why? That he may give to him that is good before God. See, here's what we got to do. We got to understand that like God's design for your abundance is not a government handout. Is that too, am I talking too, too plain? God's design for your abundance is not for you to go rob a bank or embezzle money or cheat somebody or make somebody a promise and they give you money and then you don't keep the promise. That's not God's design for your wealth and your abundance. God's design for your abundance is that you start a business that creates value for other people that they value more than they value the money that they are paying you for it. That's God's design. And when you do things God's way, it always works. Why? He's the one who set the whole thing up. So I'm a, I'm a biblical literalist. I believe the, I take the Bible literally and I take it seriously. I take it literally. Now there are, there are allegories and analogies and stuff in the Bible. Obviously there are. But the whole Bible is not an allegory and analogy. And I believe it literally. So when I was 16 years old, 17 years old, I'm sorry. When I was 17 years old and my first day in Christian school, and they made us read a passage of scripture every morning. By the way, I had already been practicing for months, like read something in the Bible. God says, do this and this will happen. I would do this and then that would happen. I was like, that was so cool right? We read Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And here's what it said, in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Watch this now. Here's what it says. I didn't put it in there. It was in my Bible when I got up this morning. Y'all ready? Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I'm like, well, what if that's true? And so from that time forward, from 17 to now 62, yes, I'm 62, as hard as that might be for you to believe. I'm just okay, so from 17 to 62, I've been endeavoring to apply the word of God to my life and practice it and do it and live by it. Not just talk about it, but walk about it. And I have seen. Oh, nobody can talk me into, like, out of the fact that God exists. Nobody can talk me out of the fact that, that the Bible is real. I've, I've been practicing it too long. And I, that's why, that's the reason when I teach people how to create wealth, I teach them from a biblical perspective, is I don't want them to think I'm the reason. I'm a voice. I'm a vessel. I'm not the reason. I'm not smart enough to know the stuff I know. I just got it out of the Bible. I just, I just took the Bible seriously and took it literally, and guess what happened? Whatsoever he doeth doth prosper. <laughs> it's amazing. Just like God said. And so when I read that you study to be quiet and do your own business, working with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them or that. I remember what it was like when I used to be so poor, I have to, I'd have to decide whether I was going to pay the gas bill this month or the electric bill. Am I going to pay the phone bill or am I going to pay the light bill? Am I going to pay the phone bill or am I going to like pay my rent? I remember those days like they were yesterday. I don't have those decisions anymore. I don't ever have to wonder who I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay everybody I owe. And as soon as I owe it to them, and sometimes early. You know why? Because I can. And you know why I can? Because I studied to be quiet and to do my own business and work diligently with my own hands as I was commanded. And now I can walk honestly toward them that are without. And all of my car payments are on auto pay. And my mortgages are on auto pay. You say, why do you borrow money if you're rich? Because I can use the bank's money cheaper than I can use mine. Because I can do, why do I borrow money? Because I can use, I know, because I can do math. I'm not mathematically challenged. And my money makes me more money than the bank would charge me to use theirs. So instead of letting them use my money and pay me a little bit, I use their money and pay them a little bit. <laughs> Walk honestly toward them or without. Pay all my bills on time. Pay all my credit cards off every month. 
my American Express, sometimes I pay it off four times a month. Why? Because I can. Why? Because I've been doing what it says in the word. I've been applying it to my life, building my own business with my own hands and walking honestly toward them or without and having lack of nothing. This whole idea that you're supposed to be broke as a joke, ready to choke, is a satanic lie. Don't buy it. It costs too much. If God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, surely he can put steak on my table sometime. I think what we got to do is we got to get a totally different perspective than our westernized ideology of the Bible and get back to thus saith the Lord and doing what he says, and you'll be shocked and blown away. See, people think that the Bible, some people think the Bible's a badge, right? I carry it around to show people this is, this is who I am. Some people believe that it's a way to win an argument. No, it says right here, this is how you're supposed to treat me. <laughs> Well, I wish I had some help in here. Hold on. But here's what the Bible is. It's instructions. Here's what the Bible is. You want a better life? Do it this way. You want a better life on earth? Do it this way. You want a better life after earth? Do it this way. I think when I'm back, I don't know that this is when I'm going to do it, but I think, I think, Week after next, I'm going to do a Bible study on why religious people go to hell. It's in the Bible. I didn't, like, it's in the Bible. Now you say, why did you bring that up? Because I, I think we missed the point. We think the Bible is a, a, is a book to teach us how to be more religion, be more religious. It's not. It has nothing to do with it. The Bible is not a religious book at all. It contains religion, but it's not about religion. The Bible is the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. It's a governmental document to tell you how the king of king wants you to operate your assignment as one of his kings, as the king of your thing, or as the queen of your scene. It's the constitution. When you do it his way, it works. You do it a different way, good luck with that. Let me know how it turns out for you. That's God's perfect pure, perfect cure for being poor. If you will do it, it'll do stuff for you that you cannot do for yourself. Stay blessed by the best. In the meantime, in between time, I'll see you on the next video.